This thing on. Crankies, I'm on. Huh. Embarrassing. Hi, right, Wavy. We're meeting at your place next week. You can bring the Scottish Conan guy if you want. <clears throat> Even though I'm an alligator and not a crocodile, we, the reptiles of this world, wish to dedicate this video to Steve Irwin and all his exploits in raising awareness about animals. Rejoice, animals of this planet. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Sparkster1701 here. And like Skullcruncher said earlier, we are dedicating this video to a man who needs no introduction, even though Skull Country did it for me. So, let's move right along to the Transformer. We're taking a look at Skull Cruncher, the 1987 Decepticon Swamp Warrior. Of course, Skull Cruncher here came out in 1987. He was one of the first Headmasters to be released. And he would be available for a limited time in 1988 before being totally discontinued. And we did, strangely enough, did not get a replacement for him. Now, I say strangely enough due to the fact that Hasbro's other major boys toy line, G.I. Joe did flesh out more and more Swamp Warrior-type characters. As they had their original Marine, Gung Ho had grown up in the swamps of Louisiana. Then they would later add a true Swamp Fighter in the form of Muskrat. And then, of course, there's famously Zartan and his siblings, Xandar and Zarana, as well as the Dreadnoughts, who all lived in the swamps. So, it was strange that it took Hasbro until 1987 to give the Transformers an equivalent swamp fighter, and then we that's the only one we would get. So, rather strange, at least in my eyes. Now, as one of the first headmasters, he would follow a pattern that would be set for the Decepticon headmasters in that they would all become animals or beasts. As the next wave consisted more of beast-like characters than actual living animals. As far as features go, like with all the headmasters... You had a panel here in the chest that you could lower. And you would have some tech specs in there. Showed he had a rather low speed, pretty high strength, and almost as high intelligence. Now, unfortunately, that's a major difference between the American and the Japanese toys. The American toys, the dials for those were fixed. They would only move due to how these indentations were right here at the post. Right here, just behind the head of the headmaster figure, there are these little tabs, and they would press against these rollers here. Well, actually, since these rollers are, loo are all loose, it would mean it would be comparable with the ja compatible rather with the Japanese toys in the fact that they released other headmaster figures in the sense of just this guy right here and you could switch the heads around and thus change the statistics of the robot made for an interesting gimmick a little bit more there in the Japanese market it had a little more playability with the fact that they encouraged you to frequently swap their heads. 
But here in America and most of the other territories where these toys were released, you basically got this was the head and this is his body and that's it, folks. Unfortunately, this gimmick would be taken out of the smaller headmasters and theirs were forced to fit the specific robot to be connected in. So, bit of a shame. Anyway, let's look at the articulation on Skull Cruncher, and in, unfortunately, again, it's very limited on this toy. The arms do rotate at the shoulder all the way around, so that's nice. He does have joints at the elbow, but it makes the arm move backward, and it really doesn't go very far at all. And he does have a joint here at his wrist. But again, it really doesn't do much good. So he's kind of like some of the original Transformers in the fact that you really can't do anything with him. Now let's look at transforming Skull Cruncher. And of course, to do that, we first got to remove all of his accessories. And of course, remove his head. Now, of course, to transform him, we'll reach back and get the gator head, fold it up onto the top of his body like so. Next, we take his fists and fold them back down into these white protrusions down beneath. And then we rotate the arms, the former arms, out to the front like so. And, of course, we can adjust the alligator feet as necessary. Grab the toy here and twist it at the waist all the way around. And then you'll take his legs and fold them up over and press them into place. Then the two tail halves, you just fold them together at the back. And then, of course... You can attach the laser, as the instructions call it, to the back end. And there you have it. You have the robotic alligator. I know some people have done customs of this alligator of this alligator form to make it look like the Alligator Prime from that one episode from the 80s cartoon. I've seen pictures of it on the internet. I have yet to find one myself, but I do find it a rather cute modification. As far as articulation goes, you basically got it in the front legs. You can move them at the shoulder, the knee, and the ankle. To adjust how high you want him to be sitting. And of course, you can open his mouth. But of course, he also needs his pilot, which comes in the form of his head. Just fold the rear section down all the way, and this becomes Grax, his trainer. Or his head. Grax also has some articulation. Very similar to what all the large headmasters do. You can bring their arms up to a full I surrender. Or all the way down flush against the body. That's about it. He has a joint at the hip. So you can bend him at the hip. And a joint at the knees. So you can bend him at the knees. But... We'll put him here like this in a sit-down position, and he gets to ride in the cockpit. Which is, of course, right here in Skull Cruncher's mouth. That seems like a dangerous place to be riding. I mean, the... Somewhat translucent piece here on the, on the top of the head does 
help lend the impression that it is more like a mecha alligator. But still, when you read the bio about Skull Cruncher, it does lead you to question being in there as the cockpit. Especially for those of us fans who played the Batman Arkham Asylum game and the many times many of us may have fell in battle with Killer Croc. Tick tock, feed the croc. Alright, now let's take a look at Skull Cruncher's accessories, and he only had three of them. Chief amongst them, of course, is Grax, who becomes his head. Not really much to say. I mean, the color scheme's kind of nice. Looks pretty good. It meshes pretty well with Skull Cruncher, so at least that's got that going for him. And then, of course, we have his gun, which the instructions describe as a ray gun. In some ways, it does have some of that science fiction appeal to it. The foregrip here on the front, or maybe that's the ammo, it's hard to say, but it does bear in mind a resemblance to some of the disruptor weapons that were featured in the various Star Wars lore. If you can find in your bookstores one of the copies of the old Guide to Weapons and Technology, I would suggest pick it up and take a look, and you'll see that the guns they use for a disruptor have something similar to this, so I kind of like it. Other than the fact that it is, beyond that, it's rather plain looking. There's nothing really to get excited about with it. Then, of course, we also have the tip of his tail. It's also described as a laser in the instructions, and that part I don't see. I mean, with all the spine ridges here on both sides of it, I could easily see it as a sword of some sort. There were, there have been several stylized uh, swords in a lot of the various media that have the excessive blades on there, or maybe it also invokes the sword whip that the character Ivy uses in the Soul Calibur series. Although that might be a stretch of the imagination for this tail piece, but yep, yeah, that could work. Unfortunately, Hasbro says it's a laser, and again, I don't see it, but maybe that's just me, folks. What do you think? Alright, moving right along now, we're going to take a look at his instructions. As you can see, it don't, doesn't list the tail as a separate piece here on the front. It shows here how to put the trainer inside. Again, that's a dangerous spot to be. And then how to change him into the head. And then now we get started changing the robot from an alligator. And of course, lastly, we get the stickers. One thing to put on him in the robot, and then the rest go on the alligator. And then at the end, we conclude with the usual stuff. Rub sign, robot points, and tech spec. 
And so, speaking of tech spec, which will be at the end of the table, and here we go. You can see they don't give him the tail laser to use here on this, probably because how it would obscure him, or come off looking like an obscene gesture at this point. It's done up in purple to show he's a Decepticon, even lists him as a Decepticon. It gives his name as Skull Cruncher, and it lists his function as Swamp Warrior. Now, of course, Swamp Warrior means that he is specifically trained to fight battles in a swamp. As there are, and even I imagine still today in the various branches of the military, there are some soldiers that do specialize in combat in different environments. And Skull Cruncher's motto is, Autobots are like bad fuel, weak and greasy. Has a habit of grinding his teeth before he strikes, annoying his friends and tipping off his enemies. And if he had a partner back home, she would probably also be complaining of him grinding his teeth in bed. Many of you out there who have a partner that does that can agree with that. Binary bonded to Grax. A Nebulon industrialist who joined up to eliminate his competition. In robot mode, uses softening ray gun. Gives metal the consistency of rubber, making his enemies easier to chew when he reverts to alligator mode. Now you see why I say that that's a dangerous spot for Grax to be in as the cockpit. How does he avoid getting swallowed when he's in there? None of the lore really discusses how he manages to avoid that. So it's just kind of, that's just weird, man. Then now, at any rate, let's take a look at his statistics. It gives his strength as 10, his intelligence is 8, his speed is 3, his endurance is 10, his rank is 5, his courage is 9, his firepower is 5, and his skill is 6, so he is pretty powerful, and likely extra smart due to being bonded to an industrialist, a businessman of sorts. That gives him a few more brains. Maybe not a lot, but some. Now we get down to my thoughts. What do I think of Skull Cruncher? I think Skull Cruncher fills a vital void that's been noticeable in the Transformers toy lines. We really didn't have anybody that was capable of fighting in a swamp. I mean, the Autobots a few years earlier had gotten the Desert Warrior in the form of Snarl, the Dinobot. So they at least had that environment covered. Now we got a swamp environment. But again, it's also one where the Transformer toys really didn't cover a whole lot. We really didn't get a lot of small boats or hovercrafts in the toy line. So that left a noticeable gap that while Hasbro should have seen that they could have, fill, that they could have filled, as they filled it numerous times with the G.I. Joe toys, why they didn't do it with the Transformers. Anyway, getting off that topic, let's also discuss his methods of dispatching his enemies. He eats his enemies. That's a disturbing thought, especially for a being that does not necessarily need to consume food in order to survive. So... That grants a horrifying death for his opponent, but it also makes you wonder, why does he do it? So in many ways, with that, it makes Skull Cruncher here a cannibal. But yet, he doesn't need to eat to survive, so why does he do it? It just comes off as strange. It's also even stranger with the fact that his trainer partner rides in his mouth. How does he avoid getting swallowed in there? 
I don't get it. There's a lot of things about this toy that I don't get, really, but I still like him. This is one I never had growing up as a child. I got him as an adult collector, and I think as a kid, I would have probably seen a lot of the humor that they were probably trying to invoke with this toy's tech spec and whatnot. <coughs> Excuse me. But, as an adult, a lot of it just doesn't make any sense. But, I'm trying not to let that hold back his placement tier-wise. I still think that he's probably at least a middle-tier character. He's certainly not top-tier worthy with these weird colors, the calling this thing a laser, and the strangeness of his bio just doesn't make him really top-tier material. But the fact that he fills a necessary void that the Decepticon army has does keep him from being in the bottom tier. And he also shows that he's like most of us. He developed a nervous habit in bat from being in battle. Unfortunately, it's an annoying habit that usually ends up tipping off the Autobots and revealing his position and possibly those of his compatriots. So, it does humanize him a bit and make him somewhat sympathetic, but I think I'm still going to hold with a middle tier rating for him. And that concludes my review of the Generation 1 Decepticon Swamp Warrior Skull Cruncher. If you like the video, please leave a thumbs up here on YouTube. Don't forget as well, hit that subscribe button down below and join up in our robot ranks. Please also consider sharing your thoughts of Skull Cruncher in the comments section down below. This is Sparkster1701 saying my phone's ringing now, so I will catch you all later.